Please turn to the book of Titus as we continue our study this evening in the book of Titus in chapter 3. Uh, hopefully we'll finish the last uh, of chapter 3 this evening. As we continue, we have uh, emphasized that this last third chapter in particular is talking about good works. And that's where he's been going in many ways throughout the, the letter to Titus. Titus instructing not only about different groups and the instructions for those specific groups, but that all of us need to be aware of the responsibility of doing what's right, what's right, what's good works. That it's not just a matter of having our sins forgiven, as he talked about in the first part of chapter three, but when those sins are forgiven, we not only rejoice in our forgiveness, but now we have responsibilities to work. And so we've talked about the sound, uh, the good works rather that he's instructing us to do. However, we've also been uh, warned about various dangers that hinder the work that we should be doing for the Lord. And so in chapter three and verse uh, nine, he's talked about the danger of uh, what he calls foolish disputes. And he describes some specifics, genealogies, contention, strivings about the law, because he says they're un unprofitable and useless. So just by way of review then, before we move on, what were some uh, kinds of examples, what would be some examples of some of the kinds of things that he's telling us that we should avoid? He says to avoid foolish disputes. What are some kinds of things we talked about that that, that would involve avoiding? What should we not participate in if we're going to avoid foolish disputes? Frank? You mentioned uh, disputes about genealogies. Okay. So he mentioned genealogies and also strivings about the law. And one of the points we made was that certainly there's things about the old, in the Old Testament, the genealogies and the teachings about various aspects of the sacrifices and, and other aspects that no longer have uh, application to us today. There's what the, what the Bible says about them is certainly was true, uh, and there's no harm in studying them, but we should not strive about them. There should not be contention over such matters as those. Okay? So on the one hand, we talked about the fact that some things have no relationship to people's salvation. They're not necessary to salvation. So we shouldn't be involved in arguing about those. And the other thing then we should not do is we not should, we should not uh, advocate false doctrines, things that would lead people astray. So those are some of the things we talked about in verse nine. Uh, that he's talked about a number of times through the books of first and second Timothy, and also in the book of here in Titus, avoiding those kinds of things. And then in verse 10, he talks about the consequences uh, of people who uh, are divisive. And we discussed various aspects of uh, that term divisive, and that's where we were at the end of class, and I want us to spend some more time on it this evening. But just in the way of review, uh, the New King James and some other translations say divisive. What were some other terms that are used to describe uh, that concept? It's divisive or what else, Terry? Says, uh, factious. Factious. Okay. Factious. Divisive. Uh, others? Heretic. All right. The old King James is a heretic. All right. And so we looked at some passages that talked about that. What's, what's the concept involved in this? Somebody define what, what this means. What kind of person are we talking about here? And we're on questions. Our questions, uh, we're looking at. Um, question number 39. What kind of activity are we discussing here? Frank. Well, uh, that Phillips uh, revised Bible, I'm not really familiar with it, but uh, it refers to it as an argumentative person. Argumentative? Okay. All right. Sharon. Related to what Frank just said, in context, uh, somebody who is engaging in these foolish disputes, pointless arguments over things that the Bible didn't tell us or that are only relate to the whole law or whatever, they just don't, God didn't tell us, they don't relate to our salvation. Okay. Arguing, Other comments? Uh, Steve. 
professed believer who maintains religious opinions contrary to those accepted by the church. Okay. And that concept, uh, that definition is probably what a lot of people think. However, the thing that's important for us to realize is that it's not the matter that's contrary to the church, but it's contrary to the scripture, contrary to the word of God. Uh, hopefully the church teaches the truth, but some churches don't teach the truth, so it's, the important thing is that it's contrary to what the scriptures say. Okay? Other comments or discussion on it? Uh, Terry. Um, I've always had the impression that members of the congregation against one another in dividing them from the unity that God expects us to have. Okay. No matter what the issue is. Okay. Causing us a division. All right. Um, so, um, all right. Well, let me well, let's, let me give you some definitions and some more technical, and then we'll go back to Terry's point. I hear some terms that uh, I have found that may be helpful to you in scriptures and so on. Some of the definitions we talked about are heretic, factious, what it stirs up division, uh, and then some of the dictionaries say things like schismatic, factious, a follower of false doctrine, an opinion, especially a self-willed opinion, which is substituted for submission to the power of truth and leads to division and the formation of sex, which I think goes along with what Terry was saying there at the end, that the people, people are divided from one another as a result. But we'll come back to that. And some scriptures that we talked about last time, 2 Peter chapter 2, talked about the false teachers whose teaching leads to uh, heresy in the lives of those who are, talk Galatians chapter 5, listed uh, heresies as a, one of the works of the flesh, which people will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. But it's also interesting, if you notice down here at the bottom there, a different form of that word is often translated as sect. So again, you see the idea of a, a separation, uh, separate groups being formed because of these false teachings. Okay? Now, other comments or discussion on any of that? Anybody? Uh, Daryl. Yeah, I, I think Terry's, uh, I think Terry's nail on the head with, with, with this word is getting at. Uh, mine says factious, the word faction comes to mind. Okay, other comments? Um, well, let me ask some questions about, about that just to get some more specific applications of it. Um, would this include somebody who simply holds a viewpoint that may, he really may not be completely in harmony with scripture, but he, did, he keeps it to himself, he doesn't make an issue of it, he just holds that view. Uh, what application would this passage have to that? Terry? If he's not teaching it or espousing it to other people, he's not inviting anybody over. Right? Yeah. He's keeping it quiet to himself. It's something that he, if it's not a false doctrine that he's holding to, but just something that his opinion about, about it would be different than most of the as long as he's not pressing others to accept his opinion, he wouldn't be dividing. Okay, Daryl? Or even if he does have some discussion with, with the brethren there, but it's done in a healthy way, uh, not a pushing kind of thing, but just a raising of, of thoughts. You know, I wouldn't think that makes him a, 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 a translation. I forgot what I 
Factious, Carol. Yeah, factious, man. <laughs> um, he's just, you know, being factious is trying to do things that, that break apart people. Okay. All right, so part of that then I think implies that he's not advocating it to the point of causing strife or friction in the congregation over it. He has a viewpoint. Uh, but the problem is that a person who acts on the viewpoint to the point of either trying to lead other people astray or causing separation in the group. Okay? Other comments, discussion? Uh, all right, let me ask this. How many people does he have to lead astray before he's guilty? Before we have to take the steps described here? Yeah, I think that's, to me, that's a significant point. Maybe he won't lead it, maybe he doesn't have an effect to anybody who will go with him, but just the fact that he is teaching a different, a different doctrine and Either he leaves as a result, he tries to get other people to leave, or just the fact that he leaves and goes to some false religious group or starts his own group or whatever, that's factious. That's the tendency of it, even if everybody else is strong enough to resist it. Okay? So I, those are some, some thoughts I hope we'll consider. Uh, much of what we're discussing then is not only just what he believes, but the, the manner in which he goes about it and the effect that it's having in the congregation. All right, other comments? on this, on what it is. Terry. I'm, I have a question. If someone's holding to false doctrine, and they are trying to lead others to false doctrine, that's different to me than holding the opinion that might differ from other people. Okay. To a false doctrine is dangerous. Okay. It's dangerous to his soul as well. I don't think we have to discuss then from that concept. What, what are we talking about? We're talking about holding a false doctrine. Um, I think maybe we need to explain that concept. Let's suppose we have, let's just use an illustration. Let's suppose we have somebody in the congregation who is not convinced that it's wrong to use instrumental music in worship. I'll just use that illustration. He's not convinced of that. But he's not causing strife in the congregation over it. There may be discussion from time to time, but he's not trying to convince other people. It's just his, person, his belief. What should we do about that? Do we get, are we required to consider him to be a divisive man that we reject? Assuming we disagree, that we, we understand that the, the instrumental music is not what God wants, but he's not convinced. What then? Yes. See, I'm not making this up. We, I've faced this in congregation, and probably some of you have too. Okay? Frank. If he's discussing it to, with other people to uh, to encourage them to follow his idea about that or his belief on that, and he's given... <clears throat> one or two admonitions not to speak of this to the brethren to try to teach other people his view of it, then, then we would have to, the brethren would have to uh, withdraw from him or uh, have nothing to do with him. Okay, other comments? Okay, uh, Sharon.
Okay, so to a large extent, I think we're back to the, the matter of his attitude and what he's trying to do with other people and what effect it's having in the congregation. There are some people who just are still weak in the faith. They haven't learned yet. Uh, so they're not convinced of something like this or uh, maybe some other issues uh, and take some time. Okay, we should be patient with those kind of people. We should work with them. And you don't just say, okay, that's, you don't have the right belief, that's it. Uh, but on the other hand, if it reaches the point to where some things you're watching for, so number one, is he trying to spread it in the congregation? Is he trying to influence other people to hold that view? The other thing you're looking for is, is his attitude leading him to separate himself from the congregation? To where he starts to look around for other congregations and he's willing to attend congregations that are practicing error and he becomes involved in those kinds of things in his own personal life and even maybe eventually to the point that he leaves the congregation over it. So much, I think, of what we're talking about, at least as I see it, has to do with his, his attitude and his effect in the congregation. Is he just learning? Is he, is he open to, to uh, listen and study? Or has he reached a hardened view in which he's trying to lead, persuade other people and maybe even leave the congregation over it? Those things are the kinds of things that to me are factious because of the effect they're having in the congregation or the effect they're having in his own relationship with the congregation. Is that making sense? Is it helpful? Other comments? All right. So we've got somebody like that in the congregation. What does the verse say to do about it? Verse uh, number four, uh, question number 42. What's the verse say to do about it? Karen. If he's causing division, he's to be rejected at the first and second admonition. All right. First and second admonition, and then reject. So what does it mean now by first and second admonition? What's the significance of that? To, uh, Frank. Well, it shouldn't just keep going on and on and on and on, uh, trying to get this, uh, this false teaching stopped as has happened. Okay, other comments on the first and second admonition? Karen. Well, I don't know if this is an exact parallel, but Matthew 18, 15, 17 talks about if your brother has sinned, you go to him, talk to him. If he does, if he has hurt you, then you take one or two others with you the second. And the third time, then you tell it to the church. Okay. Now that particular passage in Matthew 18 is discussing a private personal sin, but it does explain the concept. The idea is, first of all, the, the admonition means what? Admonition means what? Truth. A reproof, a warning. In other words, you teach him. You show him where he's wrong. Okay? So first of all, you don't just up and reject him without giving him any opportunity for him to learn the truth. But you work with him. Try to help him. Okay, so there's teaching, there's and all these passages we've talked about before, back in chapter one in particular, about the elders' responsibility, in particular their responsibility to be able to convict the gainsayer, and he talks about how that they're to give reproofs to those who are leading astray in all households. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. So um, there's to be this admonition, this warning, the idea of first and second means it's not just one time you try and say, okay, you didn't accept it, you're gone. There's a, a, an effort of patience here that you're giving them opportunity and time to correct. On the other hand, to Frank's point, the, the opportunities are not unlimited. You don't just keep going and going and letting them have harmful effect in the congregation while well, you just let it go on and keep talking and talking and talking. Okay? Other comments on the first and second admonition? Karen. Um, Galatians 6 1 also says, Brother, if a man is overtaken in any trespasses, you are a spiritual restore such a one 
in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself as you possibly can do. So that's at least the approach we use at first. And if, then if they become argumentative and divisive, right. then Okay, other comments? All right, I'm just add that again. In considering how long this continues, again, you're looking at his attitude and his response. If he's saying something to the effect of, well, uh, I haven't really thought about that before. Let me, let me study on that and, and let's talk about it some more. And it's, as far as you can tell, there's a sincere interest on his part in being willing to discuss and uh, to consider that maybe he might be wrong with the hope that there might be hope of changing, then you keep working with him. But on the other hand, if it reaches the point to where he's saying, no, 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 I don't believe that. Here's what I believe. And you see the harmful influence in the congregation. Now you're at the point where you need to, to move on beyond just talk, okay? Other discussion or comments on the first and second admonition? Okay, then it says after the first and second admonition, you reject. What does that mean? Again, you may have some other translations on that, uh, on that idea of rejecting. What is the meaning of when you, what you're talking about? It talks about rejecting them. Terry? The ESV says have nothing more to do with them. Have nothing more to do with them. Okay, and we'll come back to that. Other comments on the idea of rejecting them? Bill? In Matthew 18, verse 17, it tells you if he refuses to hear them, tell to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen or a tax All right. And, of course, that to understand what that means, we have to understand how the, uh, the Jews would relate to a heathen or a tax collector which basically was you avoid social contact with them. You don't eat a meal with them, you don't have a, it, it doesn't mean that you would never say hi to them or you know, something like that or that you're mean to them, but that you're not, you're not uh, socially associating with them. Okay? All right, so I asked them, to, well, let's go ahead to the next question then. What about other passages about church discipline? How do the other passages that we know about church discipline that relate to this passage and the ideas we're talking about? What are some other passages about church discipline that relate to what we're talking about here? I have another passage for us, Karen. Uh, Romans 16, 17, I uh, keep remembering those those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine of the and avoid them. All right, let's turn to that passage and look at it uh, and compare it to Titus chapter. 3 and verse 10 that they were looking at, notice the similarity. Romans 16, 17, I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and occasions and offenses or occasions of stumbling, depending on your translation, contrary to the doctrine which you've learned and avoid them. Okay? The similarities you see, they're causing divisions, uh, both past divisive. Uh, you note them and Avoid them, Romans 16, Titus 3, you reject them. Okay, so the idea is similar, it seems to me, the same concept. When they're having a harmful con effect in the congregation, you work with them, try to resolve it. If they reach the point, it's obvious that they're going to continue doing this and you're not going to be successful in getting them to repent. They're having a harmful effect, then you avoid them. You have nothing to do with them, reject them and so forth. Other passages or other comments on what's to be done with these, with this such a case? Anybody? Uh, Terry. Second, Second Thessalonians 3, 13 and 15 discusses uh, a brother, uh, well, 14, if anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him Okay, again, you see the concept. Uh, they're not walking according to the inspired teaching. Note the person. That is, 
recognize that this is the problem so everybody in the congregation knows the situation and as a result that everybody knows not to keep company with them uh, that he might be ashamed. But it adds, admonish him, the first and second admonition, you see, don't, but don't count him as an enemy. He's not talking about being mean, not talking about doing this because you want to hurt the person, because you want to hurt his feelings, that's, none of that's the point. The point is you're hoping, among other things, that this will lead him to be ashamed of what he's done and correct it. Other passages or other comments? All right, before we leave the verse 10, let me ask you this. Why are we doing this? What goals are we trying to achieve by doing what this verse says, or these verses that we've studied? What are we trying to, what are we trying to accomplish with this? Save his soul. Number one, we want to save him. We want him to be ashamed and repent. Okay, that's one purpose. What other purposes? Are there other purposes? And if so, what? Terry? Protect the flock. Okay. Second purpose is to protect the rest of the congregation. We already know he's divisive. He can harm the group. If the group recognizes he's in error, this is false, and they stay away from it, they know that they're to avoid that social contact that li limits that harmful effect in the congregation and warns everybody else to avoid that kind of conduct. Okay, so you've got two things. One is to help him be saved, and two is to protect the congregation. Anything else? Well, just a couple of other things to observe. First of all, the passage, well, obedience. God says to do it. Whether we understood all the reasons why or what effect, a lot of people say, well, I don't see how he's going to repent, so what's the point? The point is God says to do it. Whether we see or not, God says do it, so we should do what God says. Whether or not we can understand all the benefits, we should do it because he says it. But then also, it's important in many cases to maintain the reputation of the congregation. Uh, people see a congregation that's divided over, in this case, over false doctrine and so on, that drives people away. So we want the congregation to have the teaching influence that we need to have we need to maintain the purity of the congregation. All right, those are some observations on verse nine, uh, 10, rather, and the, uh, how we deal with a divisive person. Questions, comments, anybody? All right, what does verse 11 tell us about this person? Here's something more about him. In verse 11, and now we're on question number 44. What else does it say about this person, this kind of person? They're warped in sinning, being self-condemned. All right. So they're warped, it says. And some translations say it perverted or subverted. Okay. So their teaching is, is wrong. They're perverted. What does it mean when it says that they are self-condemned? What's the significance of saying they are self-condemned? Does this mean that they, they admit they're wrong? Yeah, I know I'm wrong. Frank? Well, they're, they're condemned in their sins. Uh, they, their, their mind is distorted about the truth, uh, from the truth, and they stand self-condemned in their sins. Their sin condemns them. Okay. What they have done is what condemned them. Are they condemned because the congregation says they're wrong? No, they're condemned whether we say it or not. They stand condemned before God because what they've done is wrong. They've condemned themselves by their conduct. So we're not the ones who de determine by what we say, that what we say makes them in wrong or puts them in, in error. They're already in error. We act the way we do because they're in error. We're not the ones who put them in the error. They put themselves there. Okay, and because they did, then we do what verse 10 says. Violated, violated God's law. Exactly, violating the scriptures. Okay, other comments through verse 11 then, anybody? Terry. I think verse 11 helps identify that this is not just a matter of misunderstanding. 
it has come to a matter of sin. Okay, and that's a good point. We're talking about sin. Very plainly, you see, sin. We're not just talking about somebody who has, uh, as we talked about before, an opinion or something like that. That's not necessarily wrong. Uh, he's talking about somebody involved in sin. Okay, anything else to verse 11? Okay. All right. So as we conclude the rest of the letter then, most of the rest of it is just concluding thoughts that, as Paul often does at the end of his letters, he gives uh, messages regarding various individuals and so on. So in verse 12, uh, what does he instruct Titus to do in verse 12? What you ask of Titus in verse 12? Bill. Be diligent. Okay, diligent to, to come to him. He wants, for some reason, and maybe not speci specified, uh, but he's going to go to a place in that to like, call Nicopolis. He's going to spend the winter there. And he wants Titus to come to him. So he's going to send a message by these two men, uh, Artemis and Tychicus. And when Titus gets that message, and he's supposed to come and meet him and spend the winter at Nicopolis. Just a personal request with regard to Titus. Okay, other comments on verse 12? All right, verse 13. Then here's two men, Zenos and Apollos. He says, send them on their journey with haste, that they may lack nothing. Now, first of all, what do you know about Apollos? Who's Apollos? Terry. Uh, Terry. He, he began preaching as a young man when he came to Ephesus. Um, he was, I think, a bit like some kind of Anyway, when he came, he was preaching only the only baptism he knew, the baptism of John. And um, Priscilla and Aquila took him aside and talked to him. And he goes on. He was an eloquent speaker. He uh, mightily convinced the Jews uh, of the truth of the gospel and was an effective teacher. Okay. So we know quite a bit about Apollos, don't we, in contrast to some of these others that are mentioned. Uh, was corrected by Aquila and Priscilla in Acts chapter 18 in Ephesus. Okay, so... What is he asking Titus to do for these men in verse 13? What is it that needs to be done for them? Help them so they're lacking nothing. All right, to be sent on their journey so they don't lack anything. Now these are, uh, well, we don't, I don't know specifically about Zenos, but Apollos we know that he's a preacher. So to send them forth on their journey so they don't lack anything means what? Support them, provide for them. And we talk about that kind of thing in lots of other scriptures. As preachers were going about supporting when Jesus sent the, uh, the 12 on the limited commission, he said, the people that you teach should provide for you. Okay, well, in the same way today, uh, we to provide for those who are preaching the gospel. We see to it their needs are met. And in particular, if they're traveling, we, find, we provide for them to travel and they places to stay, food, and, and so forth, transportation, and so on. So it's just instruction to do the kind of thing that uh, preachers need provision for as they travel in preaching and so on. Other comments on 13? All right, then in verse 14, we have then this, uh, once again, as he concludes the letter, the, our people should learn to maintain good works to, er, to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. So again, he concludes the book, as we've seen repeatedly, the importance of good works. Okay? What does he mean when he says that they be not unfruitful? Maintain good works that they be not unfruitful. What's the significance of that? Terry. Our good works are an indication of the fruit that we're supposed to be. Yeah. Okay, so it's an illustration, like in John 15, Jesus talked about his disciples must bear much fruit. The fruit we bear is our good works. The things that we do in service to God, uh, whether it's uh, helping other people in need, 
supporting preachers, teaching the gospel, um, whatever. Those are the, our good works. That's our fruit. The fruit of a Christian are the good things that he does. And so if we don't do good works, then we are unfruitful. So it's important, again, that we understand just when we become Christians, we have responsibilities. The things we do as we live the Christian life, that's our fruits. And we maintain those good works so that we're not unfruitful, thereby meeting proper needs. Other comments, 214? All right, then it concludes the epistle in verse 15 uh, well, with greetings. Greetings from those who are with him to those who are with Titus and uh, vice versa. And it asks God's grace to be with them all. All right. That reaches the conclusion of the book of Titus. Questions, comments before we close? Any overall comments anybody wants to make about the book of Titus? Any observations that you have about the book? Anybody? comments well I don't know about the rest of you but I was surprised I guess I would say how much there is in this little book you got three chapters short chapters there's a lot of material in there and I hope that you've learned a lot from it I have certainly have hope it's been beneficial to you so Lord willing next time then our assignments will take us to the book of Philemon so thank you very much <clears throat>